Good evening. Welcome to worship here at St. Paul's. I pray that you guys are staying warm and that you are safe. Welcome in Jesus' name. Tonight we talk about how God is patient with us. He, he calls out to us time and time again to repent of our sins. And he gives us so many ways in which he calls out to us. His word and his sacraments, the means of grace. And the reason he comes to us time and time again is because God is so incredibly patient with us. Because he wants to forgive our sins and bring us to everlasting life. So that's what we'll talk about tonight. But before we do, why don't we greet those who have joined you for worship this evening. Tonight we will begin with our opening hymn, which is hymn 225. This is the day the Lord has made. We will sing the first four stanzas. God's blessings on our worship. stand. Tonight we use a modification of Divine Service 1. It's printed in the worship folder. It's also on the screen, so please follow along whichever way is most comfortable and convenient for you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this, I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given us His only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by His authority, I forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 
Amen. And now in the peace of our forgiveness, let us praise the Lord by singing the last stanza of hymn 225, This is the Day the Lord Has Made. Let us pray. Almighty God, in your bountiful goodness, keep us safe from every evil of body and soul. Make us ready with cheerful hearts to do whatever pleases you. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. In our first lesson, we hear God talk about his people as a vineyard. And God tells us that he did everything that he could to allow the people of Israel to prosper. He, he, he did everything for them. And so they had every reason in the world to believe in him. He sent them prophet after prophet after prophet, telling them to look to God. But they refused. It took hundreds and hundreds of years until finally the Lord had enough and had the Babylonian Empire take God's people into captivity. But it took hundreds of years for God to finally let that happen. And that just goes to show how patient God is with us. Our first lesson from Isaiah chapter 5, verses 1 through 7. Let me sing for my loved one a song about my loved one's vineyard. My loved one had a vineyard on a fertile ridge. He dug it up and gathered the stones out of it. He planted it with the best vines. He built a tower in the middle of it. He also cut a wine press into it. He expected it to produce clusters of sweet grapes, but it produced only sour grapes. So now, you residents of Jerusalem and you men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more could have been done for my vineyard that I have not already done for it? When I expected it to produce clusters of sweet grapes, why did it produce sour grapes? Now let me tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge and it will become a pasture. I will break down its wall and it will be trampled down. I will make it a wasteland. It will not be pruned or hoed, so briars and thorns will shoot up. I will also command the clouds not to pour rain on it. Yes, the vineyard of the Lord of armies is the house of Israel. And the men of Judah are planting that what was pleasing to him. He expected justice, but instead there was oppression. He expected righteousness, but there was an outcry. This is the word of our Lord. I now invite you to share in the proclamation of God's word this evening as we take a look at our Old Testament hymn, Psalm 118. This psalm really reflects and echoes the thoughts of our opening hymn, that we rejoice in the Lord. And the reason that we rejoice in the Lord is because he is so good and merciful and patient with us. So we will sing the refrain together, but we will speak the psalm verses together. Psalm 118. my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. 
The Lord's right hand is lifted high. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. I will not die but live and will proclaim what the Lord has done. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad. I will give you thanks, for you answered me. You have become my salvation. The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Those are the fruits of faith that God wants to see in us in every circumstance in life. We don't always produce those fruits, though. But yet God is so patient with us, and that's why he, he calls on us continuously to work in his kingdom and to produce those fruits of faith. A lesson from 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 1 through 13. As fellow workers, we also urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. For he says, At a favorable time I listened to you, and in the day of salvation I helped you. Look, now is the favorable time. See, now is the day of salvation. We are giving no one a reason to stumble in any way so that our ministry will not be blamed. Rather, in every way, we show ourselves to be God's ministers in great endurance, in troubles, in hardships, in difficulties, in beatings, in imprisonments, in riots, in hard work, in sleepless nights, in times of hunger, in purity, in knowledge, in patience, in kindness, in the Holy Spirit, in sincere love, in the word of truth, in the power of God, with the weapons of righteousness on the right and on the left, through glory and dishonor, through bad report and good report, treated as deceivers yet being honest, treated as unknown and yet being well known, as dying and yet look, we live, as punished yet not put to death, as grieving yet always rejoicing, as poor, yet making many rich, as having nothing, yet possessing everything. We have spoken to you openly, Corinthians. Our heart is standing wide open. We have plenty of room for you, but you do not have room for us in your affections. I am speaking as to my children. Open, in exchange, open your hearts wide too. This is the word of our Lord. And we prepare our hearts for the gospel as we hear our verse of the day. Alleluia. I will proclaim your name to my people. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. Alleluia. Please stand out of respect for the gospel as we hear the words and works of Jesus. The gospel according to St. Matthew chapter 21. Glory be to you. In our gospel, Jesus teaches a parable in which he shows how patient God really is. Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, 
dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. He leased it out to some tenant farmers and went away on a journey. When the time approached to harvest the fruit, he sent his servants to the tenants to get his fruit. The tenant farmers seized his servants. They beat him, killed another, and stoned a third. Then the landowner sent even more servants than the first time. The tenant farmers treated them the same way. Finally, he sent his son to them. They will respect my son, he said. But when the tenant farmers saw the son, they said to each other, This is the heir. Come, let's kill him and take his inheritance. They took him, threw him out of the vineyard, and killed him. So when the landowner comes, what will he do to those tenant farmers? They told him, He will bring those wretches to a wretched end. Then he will lease out the vineyard to other tenants who will give him his fruit when it is due. Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone? This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. That is why I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a people that produces its fruit. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. Praise be to you, O Christ. At this point, I think we will uh, skip the children's lesson unless Hayden and Tripp want to come up for the children's lesson. No? Okay. Just thought I'd ask. In that case, we will continue with our confession of faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. We join together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated as we sing our hymn of the day, hymn 203, Lord, keep us steadfast in your word. my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Picture it. A dad is watching his two young children play together when the big brother hits 
the little brother. And not for the first time. Dad says, if you don't stop hitting your brother, you're going to be in big trouble. Well, a few minutes later, the big brother hits the little brother again. And again, the dad says, if you don't stop hitting your little brother, you're going to be in big trouble. I really mean it this time. Nothing changes. And pretty soon, guess what happens? The big brother hits the little brother again, right? Question, is the dad being patient? Or is he demonstrating weakness? There's a fine line between patience and weakness, isn't there? Think about the riots in Kenosha about eight weeks ago, I guess. After that police-involved shooting, there was almost instant trouble uh, in downtown Kenosha, as wouldn't be too surprising, I suppose. And that first Sunday night, many of the downtown businesses were damaged or destroyed. More than 100 cars were torched and burned to the ground. Uh, some of the uh, local leaders said right away, call in the National Guard. Man, this can't continue for another night. But those in control counsel patients. Give it time. They need to get it out of their system. And so, uh, in the end, a, a token force, I guess, of maybe 100 or so National Guard uh, were there for Monday evening. In addition, Monday night, they closed the freeway exits. They stopped the trains from coming into uh, Wisconsin from Illinois. Uh, still, the rioting continued, and uh, downtown businesses and government buildings were damaged or destroyed or trashed while the police pretty much practiced patience. On Tuesday, there were nationwide calls, you might remember, for uh, flooding Kenosha with National Guard, bringing an end to this rioting and stopping the madness. Uh, it became political, I suppose, when the president called the governor and offered more, offered National Guard troops, and the governor said, we got this covered, be patient. And uh, there was another hundred or so National Guard troops added that evening. But with so few, some of the downtown businesses apparently thought that they needed armed vigilantes or volunteer guards to help protect their businesses. So all of a sudden, there were all sorts of civilians showing up with guns including a 17-year-old from Illinois, and you know what happened. Three people ended up shot. Two of them died. Finally, on Wednesday, after apparently more phone calls between White House and Governor's Mansion, the uh, patient's plan got changed somehow, and there were apparently about 2,000 uh, extra people backing up the police and the sheriffs who were brought to the scene for that evening. And uh, as far as we know, uh, the rioting was brought to a conclusion. It's been pretty peaceful there ever since. What's the point? If there's no real prospect of consequences for lawless action, then patience can be seen only as weakness. But here's the question. What about God's patience for our lawlessness? Now, we might not be joining a riot, burning down our neighbor's house or business. But is anyone here brave enough to tell me that you're not a lawbreaker? Because I know I am. I may not break too many of the laws of the United States or the laws of the state of Wisconsin or even the laws of East Troy, but I break God's laws. And I do it all the time. And if you're honest, so do you. That cross word to a spouse, or that small lie to an employer, that uh, curse word uttered when the universe won't bend to my whim, that unkind or unclean thought about a person across the room, all of these just prove that God is right when he calls us sinners. But you see, God doesn't just zap us when we sin. No, he's patient with us. He wants us to recognize our sin and admit it. 
He wants us to come to him and ask for his mercy. And so our question today on the basis of these readings we've heard this evening is just how patient is God? And based on this parable that Jesus told three days uh, before his crucifixion there in the, uh, in the temple courts in Jerusalem, here's the first part of that answer. How patient is God? Well, God is patient enough to call you to repent again today. Let me say that again. God is patient enough to call you to repent again today. Perhaps you learned this uh, Bible verse by heart a long time ago. God, our Savior, wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. And he's patient enough to keep calling people to repent of their sin and to keep inviting them to believe in his grace and mercy and be saved. Look at uh, the story Jesus told in the temple courts on that Tuesday of Holy Week. He knew that the religious leaders of the Jewish people were conspiring against him and uh, looking for a way to get rid of him. And as the Son of God, he knew that they would soon hatch a plot to arrest him, to convict him, and to kill him. Still, his heart of love ached for children of Abraham who would perish and suffer an eternity of separation from God unless they would repent of their sins and believe in him. And so he kept calling them all throughout that week. He kept inviting them. He kept challenging them. He kept reaching out to them. And this parable is one of the ways Jesus reached out to those Jewish leaders in those last few days of his life in Jerusalem. Listen to another parable, Jesus says. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and moved to another place. So in this parable, Jesus is picturing God's gracious rule in the hearts of his people. He's picturing the church or the nation of Israel uh, in, uh, in those days. And many of the details in this parable have specific meanings. The landowner is pretty obviously God the Father, isn't it? And the vineyard is his church, his people, the people of Israel. Uh, the wall around his people is the Old Testament law, which kept the Jewish people separate from their neighbors. God had them uh, eat a different diet than their neighbors and worship in a different and distinct way to keep them socially distanced from people who would lead them away from God. The wine press tells us God always expected his people to produce fruit as he always has done with his believers. And the watchtower shows that God always has sent leaders to protect his people, to watch out and look ahead for signs of danger to the people of God. And those tenant farmers uh, to whom the owner rented his vineyard or leased it, those were the leaders that God put in charge of his people down through the years. People like prophets and teachers of the law and priests. When the harvest time approached, Jesus said in his story, uh, the owner of the vineyard sent his servants to the tenants to collect his fruit. God always anticipates uh, that believers will demonstrate their faith by producing the fruits of faith in our lives. And it was no different uh, in the Old Testament. Uh, God expects his people to live according to his commandments. But from time to time, because we're sinful people, uh, the people of God would forget about serving God and begin serving only themselves. Our first lesson for today uh, from Isaiah uh, pictures the people of Israel also as a vineyard, but a vineyard that failed to produce the kind of fruit God was looking for. And that's when the vineyard owner uh, sent his servants, the prophets, to call the people to repentance, to get them turned around and focused back on believing in God and serving him and producing fruits of obedience rather than serving themselves. But 
The leaders of God's people didn't always allow that to happen. They often opposed and tried to silence those prophets. As Jesus suggests in his parable, the tenants seized his servants. They beat one, killed another, and stoned a third. They took advantage of God's patience uh, and of his calls to repentance through prophets like Samuel and Jeremiah and Isaiah. By rejecting and even killing some of these prophets of God, the Jewish leaders uh, over the centuries showed that they mistook God's patience for weakness. Jesus' story to the Jewish leaders of his day in this parable is a little different uh, from that picture in Isaiah. Here in the parable, the vineyard does produce fruit, but the tenant farmers won't give the proper share to the owner. Sadly, by Jesus' day, the um, leaders, at least most of the leaders of God's people, had given up on serving God and uh, seeking to help God's people produce the fruits of faith in God's church. And instead, they had discovered that they could hijack the fruits of the people of God and use them for themselves. The Jewish religious leaders, conspiring together with their Roman overlords, uh, ended up getting fat and happy and powerful while the common people were taken advantage of. Keeping God's commandments was far from the minds of the leaders of the Jews in Jesus' day. Their minds were focused on keeping their positions of power and privilege and wealth. And so, several centuries after the last of God's Old Testament prophets had long been off the scene, God sent a new prophet to call his people to repentance once again, a man we call John the Baptist. And when that happened, the chief priests and the Pharisees and the leaders of the people opposed John. They did not want to hear that call to repentance. And they cheered from the sidelines when King Herod arrested John and had him killed. Now, you might think that the murder of John the Baptist would be the last straw, would have put an end to God's patience with his people once and for all. But you'd be wrong. Here's how Jesus pictures God's extreme patience in the parable. Last of all, the vineyard owner sent his son to them. They will respect my son, he said. We might ask, what would make God think that sending his own son to call his people to repentance would turn out any differently from sending all of those prophets to his people down through the years? It would be crazy to imagine a different result. It would also express in a very otherworldly way God's extreme, generous patience with his people. That same patience that he showed, for example, to an adulterous King David. The same patience he showed to the pagan people of the city of Nineveh when he sent them the prophet Jonah. The same patience that he shows to you and to me every day. When he promises to forgive us for all of the times that we have done our will while setting aside God's holy will. So, how patient is God? Well, he's patient enough to call you to repentance again today. And thank God for that. But, and here's the second point, how patient is God? He is not so patient that you can ignore his call to repent again today. The tenants in Jesus' story ignored the landowner's patience. They took advantage of it. Jesus says, but when the tenants saw the son, they said to each other, this is the heir. Come, let's kill him and take his inheritance. So they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. What a perfectly apt picture of exactly the way the Jewish leaders would treat Jesus three days from then. They would arrest the Son, the Son of God. They would falsely accuse and convict him. They would arrange for their co-conspirators to the Romans to have him killed outside the walls of the city. 
all because they despised God and his patience and they mistook it for weakness. But God's patience, as we know, does have its limits. It's not automatic, unending, guaranteed, no matter what, as the faithless tenants in the parable found out. The owner of the vineyard brought those wretches to a wretched end, and then he rented out his vineyard to others who would give the owner his share of the crop at harvest time. In this little detail of the story, Jesus is anticipating the entrance of the Gentiles into the people of God, into the church, the New Testament church. When Jewish synagogues would reject the preaching of the gospel from the likes of the apostle St. Paul, again and again throughout the Mediterranean world, Paul turned with his gospel invitation to the Gentiles. And in one generation, Gentiles outnumbered Jews in the Christian church. To the chief priests and the Pharisees, who still saw themselves as the builders of God's kingdom there in Jerusalem, Jesus addressed words from Psalm 118 that we spoke a little bit earlier this evening. The stone you builders rejected has become the cornerstone of the New Testament church, he meant, referring to Jesus, of course. And he went on to warn them, therefore I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce its fruit. Just as God had let his Old Testament people be crushed by the Philistines back in their history or be carried away into the Babylonian captivity, he would again bring judgment on the people of Israel, on those who spurned his patience and mistook it for weakness, even if he would have to bring an end to the Old Testament people of God altogether. And so Jesus here wanted the chief priests and the Pharisees to know this and to be warned by it so that they could, even at this late date, turn and repent and be saved. So, how patient is God? Well, he is patient enough to call you to repent again today. But he's not so patient that you can ignore his call to repent again today. And so, for us, we have to know now is the time. Today is the day of repentance. Today is the time to admit our helplessness, our uh, utter worthlessness before God, to throw ourselves on his mercy and ask for his forgiveness from the God whose patience is standing before us with his arms outstretched to welcome us into his eternal home. Rush into those outstretched arms of your Lord and receive his loving forgiveness today while there is still time, before God's patience comes to an end. Amen. And God's peace, which goes beyond our understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Just a reminder that since we are not passing the offering plate at this time, uh, if you haven't done so already, you can drop off your offering of thanksgiving to the Lord in the box in the back on your way out. At this time, we now continue with the prayer of the church. Let us pray. Lord of power and grace, whose eyes are on the righteous and whose ears are open to their cry, Hear the prayer of your people as we come now in thankfulness for the mercies that you pour down on us each and every day. We thank you for the gifts of your mighty providence. Make us mindful, O Lord, that you have provided us with life, breath, and being, and that you are the source of our daily bread. We praise you for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, whom you sent to be the Savior of the world. Grant that we may believe in him with all our hearts, learning from him the great truths of the kingdom, to which he bore faithful witness. 
Grant us your Holy Spirit that we may produce the fruits of righteousness. May he endow us with unwavering faith that we might always be ready to do your will. Lord God, you call us to repentance time and time again. We thank you for your patience and your forgiveness. But we also ask, Lord, that you would create in us a sense of urgency that we would indeed repent once again today and every day. And now hear us, good Lord, as we bring to you both our private petitions and our private praises. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. And now hear us as we pray the prayer that Jesus has taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Please stand. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Amen. may be seated. Jesus said, come to me, all you who are wearied and burdened, and I will give you rest. Come now and receive that rest, for all things are now ready. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus will now strengthen, preserve, and keep you in the true faith until life everlasting. Be at peace and be filled with joy because all of your sins are forgiven. Amen. Please stand for prayer. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His mercy endures forever. Whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, We proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We give thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us with this holy supper. 
We pray that through it, you will strengthen our faith in you and increase our love for one another. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And now receive with believing and joyful hearts the blessing of our God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. You may be seated for the singing of our final hymn, O Jesus so sweet, O Jesus so mild. Once again, good evening to all of you. A wonderful joy to worship our God together and to rejoice um, that our God is so patient with us, but also taking to heart the fact that we really ought to listen to that call to repentance and then receive the full forgiveness that Jesus has won for us. Special thanks to Trip Cieslick, one of our catechism students, for managing the slides tonight. Thank you to Wendy Graff for beautifying our service with music. And thank you to Pastor Labs for sharing with us that message from the Word of God this evening. Just some announcements to share with you. Uh, we continue our uh, Bible study about Christianity and how we live as Christians in a world that is so political. Um, so uh, we are continuing to live stream those Bible studies on both the Facebook page and the YouTube channel. And I did just buy a microphone um, in order to enhance the sound because I know on the Facebook stream it, it, it's fine but on the YouTube stream not so much so I got a, a, a microphone that plugged into the the laptop where we stream the Bible study and uh, it uh, I already tested it and it works so much better so you'll be able to actually understand what I'm saying and you'll actually be able to hear the questions of the people that are asking questions uh, from the Bible study. So um, that is a wonderful blessing that we have. So whether you're able to be with us for the Bible study in person or virtually, we certainly hope that you'll join us for that uh, beneficial Bible study. Um, a lot of the usual events are taking place this upcoming week. Uh, Dorcas Ladies Night Out is October 20th. That's this upcoming Tuesday. And then uh, this upcoming Wednesday, we have the uh, 
our We Worship, which is uh, the little 10-minute worship service that we have for our little ones uh, at the preschool and kindergarten level. Um, and I think in November, that's when we start the actual power hour that uh, Mrs. Beersack does. And so we'll have even more little ones who will join us for We Worship. And uh, that, that's always fun. So, And we do broadcast that as well. Not live stream, but uh, we do pre-record just like we do with most of our services. And then we upload it to a little children's message. So uh, perhaps maybe once you're online and you see that, um, if you want to watch it, may, you, know, you can certainly take away something from that. But also maybe think about sharing it for your kids or grandkids. Uh, um, so anyway, I believe those are all the announcements. Yes, they, that is. So, God's blessings to all of you. Good to worship together. Uh, Pastor Labs and I will greet you in the back as you are comfortable. Thank you.